Hello, and welcome to episode six of A Writer's History of Science Fiction, where I interview real-life authors about their personal take on their chosen genre. I'm Alex Howe, and with me today is David Brin. I've mentioned David Brin several times on the podcast. He is the author of The Uplift Universe, The Postman, last episode's recommendation, Existence, along with nonfiction books like The Transparent Society. He also earned a PhD in physics from UC San Diego in 1981 for his studies of the structure of comets, and he has since served as a visiting scholar at various institutions in addition to his writing career. Dr. Brin is considered an authority on a range of topics from online security to social and political trends, all of which you can learn more about on his website. Hello, Dr. Brin. Thank you for coming on the show. Well, uh, thank you, Alex, and uh, nice to chat with your perspicacious, perseverant, and perceptive um, fans and audience. So you obviously have an extensive writing career, but I'll start with Existence, since that's the book I recommended in the last episode, and I've got my signed copy here. Well, terrific. Um, Existence, um, people have been complaining that it's my last truly major novel. I'm working on another, uh, but I've put out seven books in the last 18 months, um, including, really? um, well, several of them I merely intensely edited for my um, one of my two YA series, uh, books for teens. I'm kind of dedicated to it because I'm tired of the cult of futility and uselessness that fills so much um, of the product that's designed for young people. And the reason for this persistent cliche that civilization is utterly useless is uh, not that the authors actually believe we live in a dystopia, but uh, because it's the cheapest, easiest way to keep your heroes in a story in jeopardy. If the nation and everybody around them is against them, uh, you know, there's absolutely no way a civilization as deeply evil as, uh, say, for instance, in the Hunger Games could maintain itself. But it proved to be a great plot driver for the uh, heroine and her stalwart companions. Uh, and I, I talk about that in my latest nonfiction book, which is called Vivid Tomorrows, uh, Science Fiction in Hollywood. Uh, it compiles 30 years of essays about everything from Star Wars and Star Trek to uh, that wretched, horrible piece of evil, uh, Drek uh, 300, and so on. Oh, David, you should try to have an opinion. Um, <laughs> So in any event, uh, one of the things that uh, I point out is that Hollywood sci-fi films, but most science fiction in general, and in fact, most Western mythology, pushes four basic moral points, starting from the word go in most of the films you've enjoyed. One is suspicion of authority. There has to be some authority figure to overcome. It could be invading aliens. It could be slathering monsters. It could be Freddy Krueger. Or it could be a, a, just a busybody mother-in-law. But there's always some kind of authority to defy. The other three memes are uh, acceptance of diversity and tolerance and eccentricity, individual eccentricity. Almost always at the beginning of every film you've ever enjoyed, the uh, hero or protagonist does something or displays some eccentric quality to stand out and make them seem different. Even a little quirk. And it turns out that you don't have to, it doesn't have to be the same quirk as the audience member. Uh, just a quirk of some kind helps the audience member to bond with that character. And we've all been subjected to this relentless propaganda campaign to the degree that we've suckled it since youth from almost all of our films. But the problem with America today is it's being used against us. We all are being told, you invented suspicion of authority and your side in the political conflicts is the brave, brash, individualistic, eccentric, uh, character. And your political opponents are the oppressors, uh, the uh, 
authorities to be um, resisted. So anyway, um, that's, that's one of the points made in, in my nonfiction book about science fiction that came out just a few months ago called Vivid Tomorrows. And in my YA series, I have two of them, I try to pre present the notion that, uh, yeah, you keep your characters in pulse-pounding jeopardy. That's the reason all these dystopias are fill the movies and all that, because it's easy to keep your characters in pulse-pounding jeopardy for 90 minutes of film or 600 pages of a book if everything is crap. But is it possible to put your heroes in pulse-pounding jeopardy without conveying that deeply evil and stupid message that everything is crap? So in... Um, the one YA series, uh, Aliens Kidnap a California High School uh, and Live to Regret It. And uh, it's sort of like Lord of the Flies. There are a thousand teenagers who've been plopped on an alien world. Uh, but it's more like Tunnel in the Sky by Robert Heinlein. And uh, so far, the teens have been doing better than the aliens expect um, or than you'd expect from Lord of the Flies. And the other YA series, um, I curate a bunch of young writers uh, in a world where humanity succeeded in making a really, really good civilization by the 2300s. But uh, suddenly, this super advanced alien race gives teleportation to all the advanced races in the galaxy. So a huge land rush is on. All of a sudden, all the uh, all the civilizations that were trapped in their solar systems by that meanie Einstein, all of a sudden, they can get out to the stars. And suddenly, humanity needs diplomats and soldiers and spies and liars. And it's forgotten how to do all that crap because <laughs> everything's been nice for 200 years. So they reach back through time and they snatch up heroes from the past who know how to do all that stuff. But here's the MacGuffin. Here's where I'm really clever. In order to make it a, a series, and there's seven novels so far, it's David Brin's Out of Time series. And, and I'm sure you'll provide links under the recording. In this future scenario, adults who try to teleport get terrible headaches or die. So you have to, the, all of our spies, diplomats, colonists who go to the stars have to be teenagers. And the heroes that they snatch from the past have to be teenagers too. So say uh, Jane Schmo uh, in the 2040s was responsible for helping to save the world from the baby boomers, from the mess left by the baby boomers in the 2040s and the 2050s and the 2060s. You can't grab her when she's this grown-up doing all this great stuff. You have to grab her or, you know, Hiram uh, Schmidt, you know, from Germany, or uh, we do um, Kim Dae-jung, the president, the great president of South Korea who restored their democracy. You have to go back to when they were 14-year-old schlumps. Don't, do not do not I'm such an idiot. Uh, what, you, you, you grab me into the future to save the world? Me? So um, anyway, that's, that's the cute premise for the Out of Time series. And the other series I'll give you a link for is, is called um, the High Horizon series about uh, high school snatched into the future. So that's three books I plugged. Three. Count them. Three. <laughs> All right. So back over All to right. you. So, uh did they grab Alexander the Great, or is he not worth the trouble? Oh, that's an interesting coincidence. They, uh, well, major historical figures are risky. Even though they think they've answered the paradox problem, it's hard to take, take that chance. But one of the recent novels, um, uh, a page or squire, young girl squire to Joan of Arc has been pulled in, and she's tough. And uh, also... Um, and a, a boy who would grow up to be a, the greatest of all Olympic athletes, uh, Leonidas of Rhodes, who um, was born about the year that Alexander died. So it's interesting you should say that. 
But we did we did uh, yank forward uh, a fourteen year old Kim Dae Jung under the uh, Japanese occupation of Korea, and he fought the Japanese, and then he fought the North Koreans and Chinese in the Korean War, and then he fought his own dictators to eventually deliver democracy and peace and justice and prosperity to the, the South Korean people. So um, being able to use you know. Historical figures. Uh, the other thing is, you know, this is also a vehicle for me to pay forward. I'm helping a lot of bright young authors to write these novels. And it's taking up a lot of my time because I meddle and teach them, um, you know, mentor them tricks of the trade. And we especially try to um, emphasize diversity, both in the authors and in the topics. One that I'm editing right now has an autistic uh, main character. And there's a transgender girl in, in another one. So we're trying to, you know, be up with the times because these are the directions we have to go in order to make that better world. All right. So there was one loose end from the previous episode regarding existence, which is, uh, do you consider existence to be post-cyberpunk and or transhumanist? Well, that's an interesting question. Um I consider existence to be science fiction about the medium near future. There are three major domains in science fiction future, and that is uh, the very near future or present, in which case you take today's society and jiggle it with some change and, and try to portray what you think might happen with people. Uh, while bearing in mind those four great lessons, positive lessons of science fiction, um, suspicion of authority, tolerance, diversity, and individual eccentricity. And those lessons are, by the way, one reason why many of the, of the despotic regimes on planet Earth try to keep Hollywood films out because they undermine their authority. But there are also two uh, bad memes spread by most films out of laziness. And I mentioned one of them. Every institution has to be evil or at least incompetent. You can't have institutions being competent because then if you dial 911, you know, in most movies, uh, the cops arrive late. If they arrive on time, they're uh, in cahoots with the bad guy. Uh, if Otherwise, they're utterly incompetent. And there's a sliding scale you should keep your eyes on. And that is the, the more badass the villain, the more competent the cops are allowed to be. So the Joker is so badass and clever that the Gotham City Police Department is actually shown doing some capable stuff just so it can emphasize how clever Joker is that he overcomes them. And so that makes uh, the tension with Batman all the more real. In Independence Day, the alien invaders are so badass, so powerful, that the United States government and military are allowed to be simultaneously competent and good, just to provide a baseline from which uh, Will Smith and Jeff Goldblum can do their thing. So it's always the individual heroes. And I have forgotten what your question was. I got off on a rant there. Oh, yes, existence. The, the near future is one regime. The far future, which I do in my uplift novels, at least two, three hundred years in the future, is where you can play tennis with the net down. In, 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 in my uplift universe where humanity has raised up dolphins and chimpanzees to be members of our civilization, they speak, they fly starships, and I complete that uh, multiple Hugo Award winning uh, uh, universe in, uh, uh, to some degree in the Brightness Reef trilogy, where you find out what happens to that brave exploration ship of dolphins out there in the reaches of the five galaxies. But in any event, that's way fun territory for science fiction. But it is kind of playing tennis with the net down. You can say, well, what if? And then you try to be as physically, as scientifically plausible as you can while extrapolating things that are scientifically impossible. It's the intermediate distance, 30 to 50 years, that's the really hard one. And I've done that twice, once in my novel Earth, 
which in 1989 had web pages before there was a web and uh, made all sorts of... Actually, there, some of my fans keep a wiki tracking the accurate predictions from that book. That It's, it's just crazy. And Existence, uh, which is more recently, and they're both set around 2040. And uh, yeah, there are a lot of cyberpunk elements. Uh, for instance, I expect there will be a new profession of cyber dentistry. And uh, basically, uh, your teeth aren't doing enough for you. So what you do is you replace some of your teeth, like the, um, especially the canines, with uh, controllers that you can press against in, or tap in certain ways and completely invisibly and thereby do your scrolling and some of your tapping and some of your controls completely invisibly to the outer world. In Earth, I talked about the subvocal, which is now true, and that is a, a, uh, something in the collar of your clothes, or maybe it's installed, that uh, lets you send signals as if you were going to talk. And the words can be transmitted that way, so it becomes a form of telepathy. The form of telepathy I just thought of recently has to do with what's a very weird phenomenon that only a, one out of 200 human beings do. But and that is that a, a, a certain fraction of human beings emit sound from their ears. And so I developed that into a form of telepathy. Uh, two people are, are at the same doctor's office to treat the same problem of this noise coming from their ears. They happen to sit next to each other. <laughs> and uh, suddenly the odds line up and they can hear each other. How's that for a uh, for a concept? Uh, and it's all the time I'm thinking, what if, what if, what if? Back to you, Alex. Talking about your background in writing, you got a PhD in physics, but you were also writing science fiction at the same time. Um, if I did my math right, you published Sundiver while you were still a student. Uh, yeah, while I was still a graduate student, mm -hmm. I started. So um, I started writing. Um, well, I mean, I, I can credit to some degree my fifth grade teacher. When I was at Caltech, the pressure was immense. So uh, in my freshman year, I started typing away a, um, a bad James Bond spy time travel thriller with a great idea that I should mine again if I ever can. My second year at Caltech, I... Um, typed away at a, another novel that would later be revised and updated and become my, my third novel, The Practice Effect, which until recently people thought was by far my most fun novel because uh, it just, you know, it's just a rollicking adventure based upon an absolutely weird, preposterous premise that on this other world, practice does make perfect. The more times you use a tool, the better it gets. Yeah, it's just it's just uh, flat out fun. Now, on the on the fun level, uh, a, a lot of people have written to me to say that even more fun than the practice effect was my novel Kiln People, K I L N, and it's set in a preposterous. Um, but I work out all the details with the meticulous care of a hard science fiction author. Future in which there's a technology and everybody gets it. Everybody in the world has, unless you're very poor. You have a kiln in your home, and you buy these full-sized, human-sized, blank clay golems, and you put on a headset, and you imprint the golem with your memories, with your personality, everything about you. And as it bakes in the kiln, it, be it becomes what's called a ditto, which is not a clone. It's a cheap copy. It has no rights, but you can send it into the world knowing everything you know, and possibly with your, likely with your motivations. So basically, there's two of you now, or you could bake five of them in the kiln. And all of a sudden, there's six of you in the world doing all the different things that you need to get done. That is, if you're the sort of person who would be cooperate with himself. And I explore those personality differences in the novel, and it's huge fun, and I have a lot of groaner puns but if the ditto 
has an interesting day or does things well, it can come back and download its memories back into the original person. So you've basically been four or five people that day. I mean, you sent a, a gladiatorial um, combat golem to the to the arena and download the memories of the battle. You know, one of the one of the ones gets off the kiln and looks at its hand and says, oh man, I'm the greenie today. That means I have to clean all the toilets and do all the chores. Screw you, my maker. I'm going to the beach. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. You're not going to remember it. Uh, anyway, so it's, it's loads of uh, fun. At least that's what people tell me. But the other fun thing I did just this last year was my first comedy novel. And boy, am I getting... A varied mail from that one. People are saying, oh, man, I almost died. To, um, oh, man, I want you to die. <laughs> um, some people say <laughs> it's the new Terry Pratchett. And some people say, Bryn, I want you to die. I think it's hilarious. A lot of people do. But then again, there are other people who say, well, Bryn, I want you to die. So it's called The Ancient Ones. And there are three sample chapters on my website so you can try to decide which category you're in for free okay so you started writing science fiction in grad school well no you're right i started writing science fiction at caltech when i was an undergrad okay but uh yeah to finish the plot thread because i just hijack whatever you say to me. but um I graduated from Caltech, barely, and uh, worked for Huge Air Crash for a while. I mean, Hughes Aircraft. That was a joke. And while there, I started in on a third novel, and that one became my first published novel called Sundiver. And I tell my students, my writing students, you should, for your first major ambition work, ambitious work, you should start with a murder mystery, because that's where you learn how to plot. All other forms of fiction, you can cheat and fool yourself into thinking that you know how to plot. You can just add another dragon, add another magic spell, add another star explosion, add another kissy kissy. But in a murder mystery, you really have to know your plot arc. And so science, uh, Sundiver is a science fiction murder mystery in which the murder victim, uh, the first victim, it, his body is dumped into the sun which makes CSI kind of difficult. So, you know, I was working on this and working on it, and I was had a very, very professional attitude about this. I was going to circulate the manuscript to these people and then fix anything they found. And uh, Since this was just barely before computers, it was actual, genuine cut and paste. I mean scissors and paste. Uh, as the manuscript grew, um, because of all the layers of scotch tape, my original manuscript was twice as thick as the Xerox. And eventually, a copy of it, a Xerox of it, wound up in the hands of an editor at Bantam Books who called me up and said, we want to publish this three times the normal beginner rate. And I said, how did you get my number? <laughs> I didn't submit it to you. I wasn't ready. And, and the editor said, you're ready. Uh, and that's the attitude to have when you have an art that you're developing. And that is develop your skills to a high standard instead of rushing out there. Unfortunately, today, it's so easy to rush out there. There are so many people who claim to be professionally published when they've just basically posted something. And that can work. It's a good thing. It's a, I'm saying it's a good thing. Andy Weir uh, with The Martian, he used that process, publishing chapters on a blog, to get the feedback that I got by, cir by circulating Xeroxes and refining his craft and improving the chapters. And that's the way to use the modern technology to actually develop your skills instead of suddenly just posting the whole thing or self-publishing the whole thing and saying, look, I, I'm a professional author. Well, uh, no, no, you're not. You may be very talented, but there's a lot of things to learn. Oh, there's so much to learn. 
so many secret skills that the be that beginners almost never notice until it's pointed out to them. And so um, I'm going to give you a link to my article of advice to rising young authors, uh, pointing out some of the tricks, the hidden tr magical incantation tricks. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. In any event, I'm garrulously just going around and round and round, but I get circle back. I've not seen all yet. Circle back to your question. Uh, when I was working for Huge Air Crash, I uh, attended seminars at uh, UCSD uh, for fun. I would eat my lunch there, and I got to know the professors because I am unabashed about asking questions. It's actually my one great talent is asking questions. And they invite uh, a Nobel Prize winner, Hannes Alvain, invited me to uh, join his group. And so I went on ahead and got my master's and then my PhD in space science, as you say, uh, the theory, the modern theory of comets. Um, but along the way, during grad school, um, that event happened with Sundiver. And so my first novel came out in the nick of time to help pay uh, my way through grad school. So after that, I did my second novel, uh, which was a little ditty called Star Tide Rising. It, uh, well, shall we say it, it was atomic level in, in the reception that it got. In the 1984 Worldcon in my hometown in L.A., I was the it guy. I would walk down halls during that convention and hear whispered the words, it's him. <laughs> May that happen to you once in your life. May you walk into a busy, crowded place and have hushes fall over the rooms as you enter. It did not last. <laughs> I was the it kid for six months. And then I pouted and said, what happened? What happened? Somebody told me, what happened is you became an established old fart within six months. Okay, so I hope I answered your question about how you started. Yeah, I think you did. Who or what would you say was your biggest influence in sci-fi writing? Well, I divide that up. Um, my chief job in a novel is to be a storyteller. And the greatest storyteller I ever knew was Paul Anderson, P-O-U-L, Anderson. Uh, not as many people are reading his science fiction novels, um, but he was highly prolific uh, and if you get started on Paul Anderson, you will spend a year reading some of the greatest stories. And what he did is he knew how to arc the characters. And most of his awards were in the novella category or novelette, because that's the length that a tribal storyteller would have told by the campfire. So I always envisioned Paul in, in animal skins, chanting something to the tribe mesmerized tribe and then when he was finished they would all sigh and he'd say okay now go to sleep we hunt tomorrow so that's how i always envisioned paul uh, ironically the greatest concocter of science fictional situations i ever knew was also named paul frederick paul and uh, he, every novel of his was about something different uh, amazing things and one of the story the novels that I used to scare people at our intelligence agencies and members of the our protector cast, because I'm one of those science fiction authors who gets invited to speak at CIA and things like that about the future, is a novel by Fred Pohl called The Cool War, C-O-O-L, The Cool War, in which the Cold War heated up with tit-for-tat sabotage. And there's reason to believe that's going on right now. Who else are my inspirations? Well, you know, uh, there are great writers who taught me style, like Samuel Delaney. There are authors who taught me about diversity, like Ursula Le Guin. And I keep learning from bright young uh, folks. Uh, Sue Burke's novel, Semiosis, uh, about uh, humans who settle a planet under primitive conditions, a planet that where the, the um, intelligent life forms are plants. I give a fair number of blurbs to young authors. That's not an invitation to send me a tsunami of new books. 
But a young guy named Sean Butler um, has a book, La Run, Lab Rat, Run, which takes the cliche of a, you know, a death race, um, but makes a lot of fantastic uh, technical science uh, extrapolations about a world where human augmentation has run wild. So, you know, there, I've had a lot of influences on my career. Uh, my friends, uh, Greg Bear and, and Nancy Cress and Kim Stanley Robinson, they are all former English majors who write hard science fiction, scientific science fiction. And that's humbling to me because I got my science, you know, the hard way, grinding my way through, you know, uh, graduate school and and, and I serve on a NASA commission, uh, NIAC, NASA's Innovative and Advanced Concepts Program. And these, and these folks, uh, they do it with seamless naturality just by consulting with scientists. They go to the nearby university and they ask them questions. And nearly always the scientists, the experts, are willing to spend time over pizza and beer uh, to, um, to help a young author work out the science of the plot. Sometimes you have to offer to name a character after them. Uh, and on, on occasion, I've had to promise to give that character live sex on stage or to murder that character gruesomely. That's called a tuckerization. And I sell tuckerizations at charity auctions. You donate a certain amount to this charity and you get to have a villain named after you in my next novel. What a deal. All right. Uh, so what is your writing process? I wish I understood it. Um, when I completed Isaac Asimov's Foundation Universe in a novel called Foundation's Triumph, tying together all of his loose ends, uh, Greg Bear and Greg Benford uh, did the first two novels in what's called the Second Foundation Trilogy under the approval of the Asimov family. But they're sort of separate novels, and they did murder mysteries uh, like Isaac loved. I took on, since I was number three, The Last Adventure of Harry Seldon, uh, after the Foundation has already left for Terminus, and his last and greatest adventure. And what I intended to do was weave in every loose end uh, from uh, that Isaac had left and tie it all together. Uh, and bring the whole story full circle. And many people think I've succeeded, but that's not, that's all preface to answering your question. Uh, for that novel, I had to take extreme meticulous care with someone else's universe. So for that one, I did an outline for the collaboration with Greg Benford called Heart of the Comet, in which human colonists settle into Halley's Comet and run into a lot of trouble. For that one, we had to do an outline. Um, I do outlines now in my High Horizon series. That's where the aliens kidnap the California high school. But for most of my novels, I dive in, and that's the part that hurts. That's the painful part, because I don't know the characters. I don't yet know where the story is going, because I know the characters and the story and the situation are going to rebel and take me in directions I don't know. And that's daunting. Whereas my great talent in writing stories is the talent that I wish I could have shared with Kevin Costner in the last part of the movie he made on my book, The Postman, uh, because the last 20 minutes ruined what was, I think, a really good movie. Uh, and Robert Heinlein, uh, always his, the endings of his novels were by far the worst. My best part of my writing is always the last third, especially the climax and the ending and the whodunit and the, you know, when you find out what the mystery and unfolded and all that. That's the part I do best. You hang with me um, through the uh, first half and you won't be able to put the book down after that. But that's a problem, because as I teach my students, <laughs> you have to hook them in the beginning. You really have to hook them. And so that's, those are the parts of my novels that um, get the most work. Uh, and the first chapter of Killing People, for instance, I have to sh show the point of active action scene 
with a detective who happens to be a cheap clay ditto and whose 24 hours is clock is expiring and he's starting to fall apart and he must make it across a crowded uh, plaza filled with real people who he has to bow to and, and not inconvenience in the slightest while, while being chased by villains. And all that chapter, I have to get across to the reader this complicated concept of ditto co clay copies that uh, have only a 24-hour lifespan and must get back home in order to download their memories. That was just like putting together one of those Chinese puzzle boxes. It was just the number of times I went through that chapter. I'm told it works real well. People can try it at my website. But that's an example of how my writing process is designed to overcome my faults, my, my deficits. It's difficult uh, for me to get the story going because I have so much to tell. And so that's why my writing process, I go over the beginnings and get feedback from people over and over and over and over again. This time I think I stayed on topic, right, Alex? Yes. Which of your books did you most enjoy writing? Well, it's hard to say. My feminist utopia, a glory season, we were living in Paris at the time, and my wife stuck her head in the door and said, what are you doing to that poor girl now? But my protagonist is a, you know, 15-year-old uh, girl who just, you know, triumphs over this and that, and she gets, she's plucky and she gets through it all, which is sort of the case for my most famous novel, The Postman. And in that case, the Gordon who uh, becomes the postman, that's a, I suppose, my most heartfelt novel. It's the one that I get fan mail from, about uh, from all over the world. And I'm told that the freedom movement in Kazakhstan has it as one of their uh, main emblematic works because it's about freedom. It's about, you know, about a guy who is wandering around after America has collapsed, who um, feels that he's the last idealist and he finds a way to lie that he's a United States postal delivery man. And that gets him fed and he hates the lie. Only he starts realizing, and I think Costner captured this beautifully, in the first three quarters of his movie, he finally realizes that his lie has served to remind the survivors that they had once been mighty beings, almost superpowered mighty beings called citizens. And unlike most of this Mad Max dystopia apocalypse thing, it's not the heroes fighting the bad guy that makes the difference. It's the hero reminding people that they are the ones who can rebuild civilization. Uh, and I think that was, that point was, I think, captured well. People are surprised by how equitable I feel towards Costner because uh, his movie, um, I mean, you know, he didn't treat me very nicely. And the movie was uh, financially a flop. Uh, though lately, with all the ructions over the U.S. Postal Service, there have been a lot of people doing YouTube videos saying, what, did Costner have a time machine? Uh, excuse me, it's me. I'm the one who looked ahead and saw how necessary the Postal Service. Uh, Costner. Anyway, the, the point is, he was an SOB to me to some degree, but so what? You know, Hollywood makes turns people into SOBs. You gotta, you gotta have a sense of your own uh, unimportance. But his film uh, was musically and visually, I think, one of the dozen most beautifully shot uh, pieces of cinema ever made. I think he's a fantastic cinematographer. So um, it's visually and musically gorgeous. 
And he was faithful to the heart of my message, the heart of my novel, what it's about. He and Brian Helgeland did their, their script. Uh, it's a goofy script, and it scooped out and threw away all the brains from my book. But that was the least important thing. A gorgeous, big-hearted, and dumb? Well, you know, that's what my wife married. Uh, I, you know what? I, I can live with that. I do live with that every day um, when I look in the mirror. Gorgeous, big-hearted, and dumb. <laughs> so that's, that's my capsule reaction to having a great big movie made. Uh, there are people right now who are noodling away scripts and all of that on Kiln People and, of course, on my Uplift universe. And I have a few, um, I have a few other things, and maybe I'll live to see something done. Why not? I mean, they are making so much stuff now. I mean, for heaven's sake, who could watch all the all the so-called content being made today? There aren't enough human eyeballs to watch it all, which is why I think it's for export. I think that Earth is maintained uh, at, at, with no contact in order to maintain our value as a reality show. And the United States of America was starting to act too reasonably. So the aliens foisted a reality show. Oh, never mind. I will go there. All right. So, Alex, you have another question. Uh, what are you working on now? Uh, you mentioned. Uh, the Ancient Ones and High Horizon. Uh, you said you were working on a, a new one? Well, I have a young collaborator for the High Horizon series uh, doing a third novel, uh, also called Colony High. It's about the aliens kidnapping a California high school to a weird world. That takes time. The uh, Out of Time series, we have five published novels, and two groups of young authors are working on on war, and that's the one where the future people teleport heroes from the past. Uh, and people can sample all of these things on my website, davidbrin.com. You can sample different chapters and decide what you'd like. But my wife and almost everybody out there want me to get back to an uplift novel, a big one. The Brightness Reef trilogy answered half of the questions that were left over after Star Tide Rising and, and the Uplift War. Um, what happens to the Starship Streaker and all of that. And after putting that down, I said, how am I going to you know, follow an act like that? I mean, there was a lot of stuff happened. But I need to get those people off that planet Kithra. You know, there's 10 dolphins and humans and one chimp uh, left on that planet, and I have to get it, get them off there before I die. I'm getting hate mail from my 35-year-old self saying, what about it, old man? Uh, and I can't remember how I sent those letters back then. It's, uh, time is a weird thing. So um, we're going to polish this off. How about you pick and choose one more or two more questions? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, since this is a history podcast, there are two history-related questions I ask everyone. First is, what do you consider to be the first science fiction novel? Well, uh, it all depends on your definition. Um, fantasy, of course. Uh, fantastic elements. Uh, heroes going on fantastic adventures. That's nothing new. We have Gilgamesh, the Iliad, the Odyssey, um, Journey to the West by scholar Wu in, in China. Fantasy is the mother genre. There's nothing new about uh, heroes um, having fantastic adventures with, uh, with fantastic beings. Well, that comes out of our dreams. Where science, uh, where the, the thing about, the, about fantasy, and it's true about fantasy to this day, is it's obsessed with demigods, with uh, heroes who are above the mortal ken. Uh, who have talents that normal people just don't have. And that's why Star Wars is fundamentally fantasy, because it's about demigods. And in my uh, nonfiction book, Visit Vivid Tomorrows, I make the point that in Star Wars, the ship is a little 
World War I fighter plane that banks against invisible air uh, and has a, a silk scarf pilot, you know, in the front who's a knight. Basically, it's Achilles. And it has room for one companion, a squire, uh, Sancho Panza, the, a droid, uh, you know, the, a gunner, Patroclus uh, for Achilles. Uh, and the Republic, there's no room for normal people. For the 10 quadrillion people who J.J. Abrams uh, destroys and Yoda uh, betrays relentlessly in that evil series. So the Republic never does anything. We never see the Republic do anything. It's fantasy. Uh, in science fiction, it's the rebel. It's the new era. Merely highly talented people matter like Victor Frankenstein in the first uh, science fiction novel of all, which was called Frankenstein. Maybe you've heard of it. What happens in science fiction is you explore the possibility that things might be different, that feudalism might not last forever. I mean, in Lord of the Rings, you get to choose which overlord you can fight for, the pretty ones who might who might be nice, nicer, but are still going to be feudal lords. In uh, George R. R. Martin's uh, Winter, Winter's Tale, or whatever it's called, the notion that technology might empower common citizens to rise up from the, this brutal, horrible form of governance called feudalism that dominated 99% of our ancestors and is trying to come back right now by undermining the confidence in uh, a scientific fact-oriented democratic civilization. In Star Trek, the ship is a naval vessel. It has 300 people aboard, all of them skilled and above average, and the captain is merely, not a demigod, but merely way, way above average, and must call upon other above average crew members every episode. So it's about teamwork. It's about civilization, and the Federation is a topic in half the episodes. The Federation is traveling on that ship with them. And that's the difference between fantasy and science fiction, is uh, you can have, I, you can have a, a, a world filled with magic, as I do in the practice effect, uh, but if the notion is that people can rise up and don't and, and can replace demigods with institutions and the actions of its fellow citizens. That's a more telling difference for science fiction from fantasy. That's where the daughter broke from the mother genre and is still broken from it to this day in the difference between fantasy and science fiction. So... I don't know if I got around to answering your question. You asked about history. Most science fiction authors have studied history more than they studied science. And science fiction was poorly named. It should have been called speculative history because the great stories are grinding crawl out of the caves and mud and then out of 6,000 years of wretched feudalism by inheritance brats who never earned their kingship. And ex science fiction extends this story into possible futures or into parallel possibilities that might have happened. So it should have been called speculative history, but we're stuck with sci-fi. Last question. Do you have any must-reads in sci-fi that people might not have heard of? Well, I, I, I mentioned Paul Anderson and Frederick Pohl. Uh, I mentioned several new bright young authors, and uh, I, I actually have a Roundup science fiction reading list roundup on my website, davidbrin.com. I'll provide you with that link, which has a lot of recommendations. Yeah, I, well, here's one. J.D. Bernal, B-E-R-N-A-L, 100 years ago, did a essay not a novel, but an essay called The World, the Flesh, and the Devil. Do not think that the Harry Belafonte movie that uses that title has anything to do with it, okay? 
But it's an amazing essay that in the 1920s was talking about human augmentation and space colonies and all sorts of things. And with that, I will keep my promise and provide in chat. No, I'll, I'll send it by email. Some things that you can link to underneath. And uh, I want to wish all of your fantastic, perspicacious, perseverant, and perceptive uh, listeners good holidays and good civilization and the courage to stand up for it. A civilization in which fact we recall that there are such things as facts and objective reality. So a fight for it. All right. Well, thanks again for coming on. It's been fun. And the same to you, Alex. This has been a writer's history of science fiction. This podcast is available on Libsyn, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, I think, Google, Apple, etc. A lot of different places, basically. You can find me on YouTube at Science Meets Fiction, on Twitter at Sci Meets Fiction, and my own website, sciencemeetsfiction.com. In the next episode, we will look at an author who had a much more cautious attitude toward science, technology, and futurism, Michael Crichton. Thanks for listening.